Well, today is a good day in America for American families, for the environment, and most importantly, for the future of this country. You know, Republicans, more than a year ago, went out across the country listening to America. And we made a commitment to America that we would lower your energy costs. That's exactly what this bill does. We made it HR1 because we care not just about the American family to let them have more cash in their own pocket, but make their energy costs lower, lower the global emissions, and make the world safer. By doing so, China will no longer dictate when it comes to critical minerals. The president signs this bill, we'll produce them here in America. Yeah. No longer will... No longer will the governor of California buy oil from Putin. He could actually buy it in his own state because we could produce what God has plenished us and blessed us with here in America. We could produce our own energy, all of the above here in America. No longer will we have to fear about what will happen in the environment. American natural gas is 40% cleaner than Russian natural gas. If you just replaced one year of the Russian natural gas to Europe, we would have lowered emissions by 218 million tons. And that can take place if the president would sign this bill. Right. We're less than 100 days from coming into the majority and being sworn in. If you look at the commitment to America in the back, you could see the checkoff of keeping our commitment to this nation, making us energy independent, making our streets safer, making our economy stronger. We're just getting started. As I said on the opening day, it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And with each week, we only get stronger, the nation gets safer, and the country becomes even greater. With that, I'd like to call up our majority leader, the author of H.R. 1, Steve Scalise. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and what a great day this is for American families who have been struggling for too long under the weight of high prices, record high inflation, all of the problems that President Biden has created, and especially for those people that have been frustrated for so long that President Biden has gone after American energy, but yet gone all around the world and begged foreign dictators to produce our energy and get our energy from them. This has never been a question about whether or not we have oil and natural gas in the United States of America. The question has been, where do we get it? When President Biden came into office on day one, he declared war on American energy. He killed the Keystone Pipeline here in America, between the United States and Canada. But it wasn't because the president was against pipelines. He was just against American pipelines. Because just days later, he gave a gift to Vladimir Putin because he green-lighted the Nord Stream 2 pipeline between Russia and Germany. So there you had President Biden picking foreign countries like Russia over America. Then you saw him, after lease sale after lease sale, permits that he wouldn't even let go through slow walking permits, blocking permits, canceling lease sales to produce oil and natural gas in America. But again, it wasn't because he was against oil and natural gas, because at the same time, he was making it harder to produce that oil and natural gas here in America. He was calling Vladimir Putin, begging him to produce more oil. Putin said no. So you know what the president then did? We said, you could just pick up the phone, call some of these great workers here. Look at these great energy industry yeah. workers that are here. Mr. President, these are American energy industry workers. They know how to make energy cleaner and more efficient than anywhere else in the world. And if you put them to work, they're going to not only be making it cleaner than anywhere else in the world, they're also going to be lowering costs for families who are sick and tired of paying 50% more at the pump, who are tired of paying 40% more in their household electricity 
costs because the countries that President Biden wants us to get our energy from, whether it's Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, he wants us to get our solar panels and windmills and batteries from China because he won't let us mine in America. Well, you know what? We stood up for America there too today because we said let's mine in America, not in China. You want to talk about standards? We are all sick and tired of these liberals in Washington who wake up every day trying to bash America and cancel projects in America. Nobody does it cleaner and better anywhere in the world than the United States of America. It's about time we open up America for business and say to all those foreign dictators in the world, we're not going to buy your energy that's dirty. We're going to get clean energy here in America. Let's lower costs for families. Let's stand up for those working men and women. And as we continue... The commitment to America we made is to stand up for those families who have been left behind by Washington for far too long. The good news for them is help is on the way, and we're going to keep doing this. We're not going to slow down. We're not going to stop working. And the man who's helped us get the votes is our whip, Tom Emmer. Thank you to our speaker for making sure that we've had this opportunity. Thank you for uh, our majority leader, Steve Scalise, who I believe today has lived up to the title of Ragin' Cajun. I think today it works. Month after month, families have been slammed with record-breaking gas prices and massive utility bills. Some have even had to choose between filling up their car or putting food on the table for their families. Democrats' war on domestic energy sent energy costs skyrocketing, and Americans were forced to foot the bill. But today, House Republicans said, no more. I'm proud of our work to pass H.R. 1, a bipartisan, common-sense bill that unleashes... <laughs> that unleashes American energy and drives down costs for family. The core tenets of the bill were simple. You want lower costs for Americans? You want to allow energy companies to thrive without all of the bureaucratic red tape? You want to make America the energy superpower of the world? Then, guess what? You vote in favor of H.R. 1. Unfortunately, over 200 House Democrats chose to vote against this bill. And President Biden is already irresponsibly threatening to veto the legislation. But we've seen how he's changed his mind, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the past. Make no mistake, Americans will remember who stood up to give them some relief at the pump and end our reliance on foreign dictators for oil. They will also remember the ones that didn't. Today was a big win for the American people, and I look forward to celebrating more wins ahead as the House Republicans continue to govern. And with that, I turn it over to the best conference chair here, Elise Stefanik. Thank you to the whip. This is a historic day for America. This is about putting American workers first. This is about putting American families first. As we work hard to lower the cost of energy prices that have skyrocketed under Joe Biden's failed and catastrophic leadership. As the speaker said, we are less than 100 days into the new Republican majority and we are driving the policy agenda. Just look at the checklist. We've reopened the people's house, which is why we have a crowded room today. Let's give a round of applause for that. We repealed the 87,000 IRS agents. We passed the Parents' Bill of Rights. And today, we are so proud to pass HR 1. And for all of the reporters, it is important to note that multiple Democrats cross the aisle because they know that we are governing and delivering solutions. And I am so proud to introduce one of our leading committee chairs who helped make this happen, Chairman Bruce Westerman, our Chair of Natural Resources. <laughs> Thank you, Elise. It feels great to win. And this is a winning team behind me right here. But this team is not winning for ourselves. We're winning for the American people, and H.R. 1 is a victory for the American people. It truly will do what it says it will do. It will lower energy costs, but it will also give us energy security. It will give us national security. It will break Chinese supply chains, and it is part of the commitment to America. And I just want to thank the leadership of the team, a team that uh, Kevin McCarthy has put together. He and Steve Scalise, Tom Enemer, Elise Stefanik, the whole crew is focused on unifying Republicans for the benefit of America. 
and there has been great teamwork. Uh, this bill is not written by any one member. It came from multiple members from multiple committees. And uh, I've got two of my fellow committee chairs here, Kathy McMorris Rogers and Sam Graves. I can tell you, after Putin invaded Russia, we have been working on this legislation. But we sat down and said, we have to have comprehensive energy policy. And it can't just be in the jurisdiction of the Natural Resources Committee. It can't just be in the jurisdiction of Energy and Commerce. There's the jurisdiction of TNI. It has to be comprehensive across the conference, and we have to bring everybody on board. And with a very tight margin, a majority margin, we passed a bipartisan bill today because we work together on behalf of the American people. Thank you to everyone that did that. And I want to introduce the chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, someone who's had tremendous input on this bill, Kathy McMorris Rogers. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bruce, uh, my partner, along with Sam Graves and the entire leadership team, all the members that are here, proud to stand with this entire team in support of our leadership on HR1, Unleashing American Energy. But I think I'm most proud to be here with uh, those that are yeah. wearing the hard hats that say, proud American energy workers. Yeah. That is. This legislation is about unleashing American energy. It is about making sure that America is producing more domestic energy. And we appreciate what you're doing every day to make sure that we have reliable, affordable energy. And unfortunately, we've seen from the Biden administration a shutting down of American energy. And, and you know, energy is foundational to everything. It is. It is what has lifted people out of poverty, raised the standard of living more than any other country in the history of the world. And that's why American energy is so important, because it is the driver of American leadership. And we, as others have said, we do it better, we do it cleaner, we do it more efficient than anywhere else in the world. So when we are increasing domestic production in the United States, it means we're also lowering carbon emissions. America is leading on all fronts, and it's so important to addressing what's driving the cost, uh, to fill your car up with uh, gas or heat your home, and that's why we're so excited to be here today to pass this legislation bipartisan, bipartisan over there in the Senate. You know, uh, we have a strong bipartisan vote in the House, and we're, and we're excited to uh, see the Senate take it up for uh, consideration. Thank you, everyone. And I'm proud to introduce Chairman of the Transportation Committee, Sam Graves. You know, the reason for this, uh, for this bill is, is lower energy costs. And my constituents are screaming because their heating bills have been outrageously expensive uh, this year. So the Transportation Committee, our component to this um, was 401 permitting reform, a bill that was originally co-sponsored by David Rouser and Garrett Graves. Um, what this bill, or what the 401 permitting process does is prevent states from being able to weaponize the uh, permitting process. And that's happened over the years. What Republicans are about is water quality. So we want to make sure that permits are denied or granted based on water quality. We in no way take away states' uh, opportunities to increase that, decrease that. That's up to them. Um, but we want to make sure that those, uh, that those permits are granted or denied based on water quality, and that's what Republicans uh, stand for. I am now introducing Garrett Grace, one of the co-sponsors of that particular piece of legislation. Garrett. Thanks, Dad. Um, <laughs> you know, if you look at what's happened over the past year and a half, we put a commitment to America together, and I think that really embodies what the founders of this country intended. We traveled across the United States engaging stakeholders, engaging individuals, and engaging families about their vision for America. And what this bill does is it unleashes America's energy resources. Because we don't think it's right that 40% of Americans, individuals, and families over the last two years have had to choose among paying for utility bills, buying medicine, or paying for groceries. These are false choices, and it's absolutely unacceptable. What we've seen over the last two years is the Biden administration carrying out incomprehensible energy policies under the concept of trying to address climate change. The truth is, is that emissions have actually gone up under the Biden administration, not down. Under the previous administration, emissions went down, an average of 2.5% a year, and we've watched over the last two years as emissions have gone up over 6%. 
So you're failing on the very objective that you're trying to achieve while you're pushing American families into energy poverty, charging them higher gasoline prices, higher utility prices, and one of the biggest drivers of inflation. We're delivering on a commitment to America because this is the right thing to do, just like you would do in your own family, just like you, you would do in your own business. You're unleashing America's resources. We have oil and gas here. The Biden administration's own Department of Energy released a report just two weeks ago showing the global demand for oil and gas is going to increase 50% over the next 25 years. And what are we doing? They're out there announcing shutting down, stopping domestic energy production. This is completely illogical, and it's all on the backs of American families. And let's be clear on what these higher prices are. These higher prices are taxes. They're taxes that are being charged on America's families to try and achieve a political agenda that they're completely failing at. I want to thank all of these people behind me. The folks that sat there and worked so hard to take the ideas that we heard all across America and translate those into the, the package of bills that we, we passed today. I want to thank the incredible leadership team back there led by Speaker McCarthy to, to make sure that we engaged everyone and gave them a voice in this process to ensure that we weren't just advancing conventional fuels, but that we unleash America's renewable energy opportunities as well, to where we truly can lead forward on a path of affordable energy, clean energy, and ensuring, ensuring that we protect America's energy security. Thank you. I want to give a special thanks to Garrett Graves, because it was more than a year ago that he was the chair of the task force, and to all those members behind me that participated in that task force. The extra time you went, the travel you went across the country to listen, and especially thank the American energy worker who continues wants to have a job instead of the President Biden shutting him down. America's stronger today because of what happened in Congress on a bipartisan basis. America will be even stronger tomorrow as we get back to work. With that, let's open it up for questions. Yes, sir. I think you're overthinking it. What we did was spent a year listening to the American public and you just write good policies. And you know what? You don't worry about where the vote's going to be because at the end of the day, you even get Democrats when they're whipping really hard with their leadership trying to force their members not to vote for it. It actually comes forward on a bipartisan basis. We've watched when we put bills on the floor, the president will put in a sap and tell all the Democrats to vote no, but he's opposed to it. Then he turns around once he reads the bill and says, oh, I'm going to vote for that. We've watched it time and again. So you might analyze a lot and worry about what you think we're doing. We don't do that. We just focus on policy. You make good policy, what happens at the end of the day, you make America stronger. Thank you. It's been three days since the mass shooting. I'm telling you, there's not one person in America that doesn't see the devastation what happened in that school. There's not one person in America that doesn't want to try to solve all this. We want to make sure we take in all the information. We watched a school that was locked. And I think everyone would believe somebody has to be mentally ill to enter a school. Literally, when you read the report, she picked between schools based upon whether one school had an armed officer that could stop her. She literally shot through the window to go in to these young children. I do want to thank the officers. The officers did not delay. They were young men themselves. They didn't know what they were running into and they did not slow down as they went hallway to doorway to save the others that were there. We will look, getting all the information, is there anything that we can do more? But I would say to a nation as a whole, that the problem that we are today is not just going to be a legislation. We've got to have a se severe conversation here with this country. We've got to deal with mental illness. We've got to see what's driving individuals to think you would go to innocent children. The Christian school, to shoot in, to literally write about it. I don't think one piece of legislation solved this. I think a nation together, working together, 
solves a problem that's much bigger than us. Well, yes. So to that point, uh, are you going to meet with uh, the minority leader, uh, Jeffries, about it? He said today that there's plans for you to meet about it. And you know, shouldn't Congress be the one taking the lead on this initiative? As, as Mani mentioned, perhaps an assault weapon ban, expansion of background checks, and funding for mental health. I think this. I think the thing that we will do like we deal with any issue, just like the issue that we're dealing with today with H.R. 1, what did we do? We didn't just write a bill here. We went across the country to get all the facts. That's exactly what we'll do and look at the facts. Yes, ma'am. All right, let me walk you through. Um, I know we're here for HR1, but I appreciate all your questions. Um, we will get all the information how we deal with any subject and we'll work through it. Unfortunately, the president, um, you know, back in 2011, he called them the um, Biden talks. I sat down with the president on February 1st. We had a good discussion. He said he wanted to meet further. He actually tweeted out afterwards that he wanted to have further discussions. He told us the very next morning, not just myself, but he told those members who went to the um, prayer breakfast that we're going to meet. He told the Democratic Congress on their retreat that he's going to have a meeting with me. He apparently doesn't want to meet, and I don't understand why. We were very reasonable, responsible. What we do know, especially after the Congressional Budget Office came out, that America taxpayers will have to pay $10.5 trillion in interest in the next 10 years. Even though for the last 80 years we've only paid $9 trillion. We do know for the first time in American history, based upon the Democrats' rise in spending more than $6 trillion more dollars. $6 trillion more. What happens? Well, if you studied economics, if you had the pleasure of years past, Milton Freeman, one of the best economists ever to come out of America, told you that there's only one place inflation begins or starts, and that's with government, when they spend too much. We've watched interest rates have to rise based upon what the Democrats have done. Now we watch that there's a bank crisis. But we've got a president in office that seems to treat issues the same way. Afghanistan he missed and set us back decades. We watched him tell us that inflation was transitory, that it wouldn't sustain itself. We watched him slow to action when we asked back in 2015 to give the Ukraine's javelins so they could defend themselves so Russia would not invade. Now we're watching him do the exact same thing, but it's more dangerous because he's dealing with the American economy. I don't understand why he thinks the debt ceiling just gets raised. We're sitting here believing that if we curve our spending, what will happen? Lower inflation. If he signs H.R. 1, it will lower inflation, bring more American jobs, the global environment will be stronger, and you know what? He no longer will have to get in a plane and go to Saudi Arabia and be embarrassed for begging for more oil. We can make American oil with American workers. So I'm sorry. He needs to change his behavior. Go back to the person he said he was, that you need to sit down. Our government is designed to have compromise. We don't have a predeceived idea of where it has to go. But I think there's three things that we should look at. We should be able to lower, save, and grow. Lower our spending. Save the taxpayer money. And grow our economy, just like H.R. 1. You know, we talk about what it will do to energy, but if you want to build anything in America, you need H.R. 1. You want to build a road, you want to build a bridge, you want to have a permitting process to put solar or wind on average five to seven years. And you wonder why China continues to jump ahead. Well, we say no more of that. Sign H.R. 1 and we'll make America stronger. But more important, Mr. President, I'm ready at any time, at any moment. I'll come tonight. It doesn't make it difficult to sit down and negotiate and find common ground to make America a little stronger and make sure we stop overspending. Okay, yes. Sir, Mr. Mayor, I hear you talking about gun confiscation, having that conversation with America, violence, and also looking at what happened in Nashville, going from there. But you, know, you, you hear this so often from leaders on every level, kind of these ideas of conversation of looking at it. What specifically do you think will happen here? Who specifically should look at this issue from your conference? Well, let me specifically answer your question. Um, I disagree with your first premise that people just talk about it. I watched this Republican conference when we had a majority take action. When we watched a shooting in a church in Texas, 
where an individual never should have had that weapon. Why? Because he was dishonorably discharged from the military. And it was the military that wasn't updating the records. So you know what? First, we got all the information. So I'm sure at that moment in time, I'm not, I probably don't have the exact memory, but I'm sure you asked me the same question then. And I said we'd look at all the information and we'd make sure that that problem couldn't happen again. And we took action and corrected it. So we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to find all the facts. But one thing I will tell you, it's not just legislation that solves these problems. Collectively as a nation, we're going to have to come together. We watched times when an own family member would call the FBI warning of the signs of someone we saw. And we watched that child go shoot a school too. We don't want to miss opportunities to stop what just happened. And we will do our job. Yes, ma'am. I, I, I talk to Joe Manchin often and Kristen Cinema. Those seem like two people that want to do a lot of things. I'm not sure. We don't have many bills over here that's come out of the Senate on any subject, so it's hard for me to say anything he passes is dead. He'd have to get to work first. Um, that's what we heard from the president when he said he wanted to stand with the 172 Democrats that are so extreme in this House that they thought they could decriminalize carjacking and some forms of murder, but they changed their minds. I think at the end of the day, if Schumer would even ask his own conference, I think there's a lot of people there that want to make American energy, want to make America stronger, and if they really care about lowering global emissions, because under their majority, all they've ever do is raise emissions. Yes. What proposal? Your budget proposal. Well, first of all, if we're talking about debt limit and we're talking about budget, there's two different things. Just so everybody knows, a budget resolution doesn't even go to the president, and a budget resolution doesn't raise the debt limit. So, so if I may clarify. well, if I would call them savings, because if you just added $6 trillion, and if you increase discretionary spending by 30%, and you created inflation in America, the only way to stop that is to be able to curve it. I've given the president many ideas. How can you limit, how can you save, and how can you grow? Well, how would you limit? Well, we've got billions of dollars sitting out there that have been dormant for more than two years that people have not spent. So why don't you save the taxpayer money and pull that back? We've got abilities that how can we help the supply chain? How can we make, help people get back to work, give them the training they need and others? Well, you could put work requirements for able-bodied people with no dependents. That means if they're going to school, if they're looking for a job, they're fine. But we can help the supply chain work back. We can grow the economy. How would we grow the economy? HR1 is one of those abilities to do that. So there's a lot of ideas out there. We have more than $4 trillion in savings. We can limit the amount of growth as we go in the future. The real difficulty here is if you simply check the facts. If the president would read what the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan individual said, if you take the 50-year average of spending in America, that's roughly 21% of GDP. But under President Biden, he's spending more than 23.7% of the GDP on the way to 25%. If you look at revenues, because the president's only answer is to raise more taxes. On average, in 50 years, we usually bring in about 17% of GDP. Today, we're at 20 only two, hundred, only two other times in modern history in America have we ever brought in this much money on a percentage, but we're bringing more money than ever before. The problem was when the Democrats had all majority, they spent like drunken sailors. They created inflation. Then he went after the energy industry and even made it worse. So what we need to do is sit down like any household would happen and find places that we can eliminate waste, the fraud, but more importantly, create a system that makes the energy in America stronger, lower price, but make our economy even better. Will the conference come to an agreement on that? The conference is very close, and if the president doesn't act, we will. If you can explain to me what's partisan in making uh, energy. Could you name those for me? Because I'm not sure. Because you had a bipartisan vote out here, so what's controversial? The only thing that would be controversial is that you have the majority of the Democrats who have such extreme views 
that even when we pass the Parents' Bill of Rights, their extreme view believes that parents shouldn't know what's being taught to their children. They think so extreme that you shouldn't tell parents when some violence happens in your school. They are so extreme in their views that they don't believe the schools should tell them where they're spending their money. And now we just found the majority of them are so extreme that they'd rather stand with China and Russia than with the American energy worker. So I'm not sure what's controversial in the bill. I'm not sure what's controversial that you can speed the process up so we can make things in America. We built the Empire State, we built the Empire State Building in 400 days. But it takes us seven years to build a simple road today. That's wrong. And we're not going to be able to compete with other countries if we continue to hold America back. All right, yes, last question. Yes, yes, not this week, we're, and we're going to be away. You know, you know what's interesting? If I take your question, I could have had that same question when you said, why stop D.C. from decriminalizing and allowing more carjacking and more murders. It's not going to get through the Senate. It's definitely not going to be signed by the president because he simply said he was opposed to it and it got signed by the president. No, let me finish. You asked your question, let me answer. I could take that same position, that same question you asked right now of whether we could end the pandemic in America. He said he was opposed to it and now he's going to sign it. So. What will the markets react? I think the markets will be very excited that one entity here is taking action. We have been reasonable, responsible, asked to sit down with the president for months. He is making the decision that he wants to put the economy in jeopardy. I don't know what more I can do and how easy. I would bring the lunch to the White House. I would make it soft food if that's what he wants. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever it takes to meet. I just don't know what's changed from his comments before when he says it's not right if people don't sit down and meet together. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. I haven't seen what you're talking about, but Putin's authoritarian, President Xi's authoritarian, and I'm very concerned where I see the world right now. It looks like 1936. We got China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. I watched overnight last night that Russia arrested a Wall Street Journal reporter. Exactly what they did, but it also goes to the behavior of the administration. If they want to pay ransom, they're going to continue to go after people if you want to be strong. I've watched in California, Gavin Newsom shut down 20% of the energy produced in California. But we didn't use 20% less. He then started paying Putin for 50,000 barrels a day that Putin used to build an army to invade Ukraine. I've watched our own president go to Saudi Arabia and beg for them to produce more while at the same time looking at these American energy workers and telling them they're out of a job. I will tell you this, every statistic you see, every measurement you can have, under this administration, emissions have gone up. If he would allow natural gas to replace Russian natural gas for one year in Europe, not only would Putin be weaker, not only he couldn't evade Ukraine, but the global emissions would have been reduced by 218 million tons. So I don't know what's extreme about that. I don't know what's controversial about that. I can't force these people to change their extreme behaviors, but what we can do is pass bipartisan legislation with Republicans and a few Democrats on the other side. We can walk out to the American people, listen to them, come back and find solutions and sit here and gladly take your questions and wish you all a very, very happy Easter. Thank you all. Thank you.